morning and welcome to not my garden. I am out on my back patio trying to prick out some lettuce seeds that have sort of gone past that point, but that's all right. Uh, we're really scrambling here to get stuff done. It is the season to get things done. We have a lot going on. Um, part of the reason I am doing these lettuce seeds um, so late is, well, a few reasons. One, our greenhouse isn't quite done yet. Um, it is currently in the basement, not ready. And um, Matt is working tirelessly on that. He was out until very late last night, burning the last bits of sunlight trying to get the foundation done, which if you've ever lived in New England or live in a rocky area, you know how almost impossible it is to uh, dig an area that is flat and free of rocks. So we had to dig out um, the base, uh, which was a lot. There was a lot of rocks. And then we had to um, fill it in with three quarter stone for drainage and then we put cinder blocks on it yesterday and one of the things that came up yesterday while we were out buying the rest of our cinder blocks was we were riding around in a town called Hadley now Hadley is a 10 minute drive from this house if that um, we go through Amherst which is the next town over uh, going west in Massachusetts here. Um, it is right at the base of the Holyoke Mountain Range um, and the, uh, the river, I cannot remember the name of it, um, but it's called the Pioneer River Valley. And it was really interesting to see because we're driving around and everywhere we went, people's not just their crocuses, but their daffodils, and in some cases their tulips were up. And if you know anything about those kind of bulbs, those usually don't come about until much later. So we're driving around and there are just daffodils in full bloom and it looked like spring. The trees are starting to bud out. Yeah, see my seedlings here have gotten a bit tangled, so I'm just gonna take the strongest ones. Um, and yet here, just this morning, I woke up and with great delight saw my very first crocuses had popped up. So here we are, less than a 10 minute drive away on top of a hill and we have our own climate. So it brought up a really interesting thought that I wanted to share with you and point I wanted to make about zones zones and microclimates. So if you have ever plugged in on say um, a site you're trying to buy plants and you want to know if um, <clears throat> a shrub is a perennial in your area, it will often say, oh, plug your zip code in. And what it usually does is it gives the closest range to where, it, where its zones are set up. So oftentimes when I go to plug in my zip code, I come up with zone 6B. Now, Hadley or Amherst, parts of Amherst, are I'm sure part 6B, but we here are not. As you can see, our trees are not budding out. They are not leafing out. They're not quite there yet. Um, and we're just, just starting to see little bits of life. It was very warm here yesterday, which it tends to be, and New England is no joke with the cold um, and the extreme weather, really, in general. Uh, we are hardy, us New Englanders. It gets very, very hot here in the summer, and it gets very cold here in the winter. Um, we do get quite a bit of snow, at least we did this year. And it's easy to sort of get lulled into this sense of, oh, there's some warm days, and so spring is here. Spring is not here. Um, we can still get frost well into May, 
uh, we had a lot of snow last year in May, in fact. And then we had one of the driest, hottest summers I have maybe ever seen. And we actually lost all of our peaches, that you can see behind me, just barely, um, due to heat stress. So when you look at all these things, it's easy to get, I know, excited about spring being here, but please do not get lulled into a false sense of security. Also, it's worth noting that you want to look at a couple different sources when you're trying to figure out what zone you're in to find out what your last frost date is. You really need to get a couple different sources because it just may not be accurate. Like I said, mine often comes up as six. It is not six, it is five. We are five B. And even within there, there's a little wiggle room. Being on top of a hill, we have a higher elevation and oftentimes it is 10 degrees cooler up here than it is just in the center of town, which is a two minute drive away. So do a little bit of research before you commit and you're really sure of what zone you're in. Um, it's also worth noting that um, climate change has definitely had an effect, it is real. Um, we notice here that our summers are a lot hotter and our winters are a lot more extreme, a lot more cold. So we get more extreme temperature swings, which is a big part of why we are so adamant about doing regenerative agriculture. Um, it's just something that we really believe in and we want to help heal the earth, sequester carbon, um, and it's so really easy to do um, when you look at it. Now, I do want to answer a little question uh, for anyone that is curious because it's come up a few times, <clears throat> most recently at uh, Maple Fest from a fellow farmer friend of ours. So she's looking around at, you know, our little bits of this and our little bits of that. And Matt's talking to her about planting polycultures on contour. And she said, I have to ask, are you guys preppers? No, we are not preppers. <laughs> we are not preppers. Uh, we are not religious. We do not belong to any cults. We are just farmers, believe it or not. Yes, on some level, um, it's nice to be prepared um, and have a secure food supply. But it's very interesting when even another farmer looks around at regenerative agriculture and kind of shakes their heads and thinks, well, you must just be farmsteading or you must just be homesteading and you're probably prepping for something. We're not. And it's really interesting because regenerative agriculture is still that different looking to so many people and we are trying to prove that point that you can grow a huge abundance of food you can be an actual farmer and make money on a very small piece of property you can grow an abundance of food in a very very small area and that's really the model we're trying to prove we have seven and a half acres that is a lot to some people to some people that is nothing and we've sometimes been said, it's been said, like, why are you even bothering on such a small piece of property? Why would we not? Look at all of the opportunity we have here to grow and do many different food systems and polycultures. And we want to be able to take this model and help people apply it in their backyards. Do you have a half an acre of grass? What can you grow on that? How can you turn that into a carbon sequestering little Eden in your own backyard. And I think it's really just worth looking at and investigating. A lot of what we're doing here is theory. I mean, we've done little bits of it over the last few years, but we've really dove in head first in the last year. And we don't know what's gonna work and what's not, but we're never gonna know until we do it. You know, you can watch a million YouTube videos you can get the ideas and get inspired and that's great, but you really need to just try. Try and fail and see what happens. I mean, these little baby lettuce leaves <clears throat> may not make it. They're a bit spindly um, because they are not in an actual greenhouse. 
So I've planted out a lot of things that I normally wouldn't plant so early. Uh, they don't have quite the leaf structure that I'm looking for for transplant, but I don't really have a choice. I need to clear up space in my little tiny greenhouse over here until the big greenhouse is ready. And I sort of feel that if I can plant them on, transplant them on, get them into the ground, get them nice and deep, cover the root or cover the stem, that little spindly stem, I am going to have better luck. And then I can always cover them with fleece, which is what my plan is, because again, yesterday it was about 70, I'd say, maybe like late or, you know, high 60s. And today it's cold and it's going to rain. And sometimes they say, the weather report says, oh, no frost. And we get a frost. So I am not taking any chances here. Uh, I am going to plant these out and then I'm going to protect them. So my point I'm trying to make here is do a little bit of research <clears throat> and then just kind of do your best. Give it a chance. See what works. See what doesn't work. See if this is, you know, a thing that interests you or maybe it doesn't. But you're never going to know until you try. So on that note, I am going to finish potting out my romaine lettuce so that we have some lettuce greens to eat here worth soon. noting that's coming up very quickly. We're at uh, the very last days of March here. But something that is coming in two weeks, we are getting our baby chicks. We are getting the majority of them. These are our layers and we've actually never had chickens before. I've worked on a farm, a very large uh, animal farm before, um, but I've never raised them myself, believe it or not. Um, and I sort of swore I would never get animals. I'd never get chickens. And here we are. So we're getting the majority of our layers um, from my good friends, Sarah and Meg of Silver Fox Farm. Um, who also happen to be local and they breed specifically for temperament and health and I love that. Uh, that's what I'm looking for. So we're getting um, Marins, Easter Eggers, Olive Eggers, um, just a couple different varieties that they have and then we actually ordered a few other, I can't remember what varieties we ordered from um, an online store which is not really the route I wanted to go but we also ordered our Toulouse geese online and the place we ordered them from would not let us order just geese. So we had to get some more chickens. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how this all plays out. We have to build our brooders. Uh, we have our, our heat plates and all this, but I'm really, really excited. It just means though that there's that much more to do on the farm to get ready for our new babies. Um, and we still have to finish the greenhouse, get plot clearing done, and then Matt has to find a place for his sawmill and get it set up. So there's just, it's kind of a mad dash to the end um, until our first CSA um, is to be delivered on the first week of June. So there's just a lot that needs to go on. So we're trying to just prioritize our tasks here. Um, I'm doing this because I want to make sure that we have food as soon as we can grow it. Um, but also as just kind of a backup for the CSA. Um, if I'm not further along with um, starts in the greenhouse, at least we will have some lovely lettuces. So these romaines are going to go undercover. Um, but it just, it's a lot going on. So we are trying to just pace ourselves and do one little task at a time. So you're going to have to stay tuned. Um, it's just chaos around here with three very small children. Um, my mother is an absolute saint and comes over and watches them often so that we can get this stuff done. Right now they're banging on the window because <laughs> they want to come out. But stay tuned, there's gonna be a lot coming up. Um, and just in a few weeks, we're gonna have those little baby chicks and our little baby geese, and I'm so excited about it. So, check back.
as you can see here, these are our peach trees. Um, the buds are just getting ready to just burst out of here. And it's just covered in little fuzzy buds. So hopefully this year we'll get a lot of peaches. Um, we're going to be trying to cut some key lines and perhaps put some berms in to help uh, slow the water from just running off the property and actually help irrigate the peaches a little bit. As you can see, I didn't cut my um, time back. I was hoping that just giving it a little bit of um, extra protection, um, you know, if the outer layers died back, that the inside would stay alive. And I, I think that worked pretty well. Um, that also seemed to work well for my sage. Um, as you can see, I still have some that's alive and I was actually able to harvest this pretty much all the way through the winter. Uh, same for here. So we do have some dead dead leaves on the old canes and then um, some that survived. The thing that I find very interesting is my winter savory did fine. I cut it back. It was absolutely massive. It took up this entire area. Um, but I've lost some lavender and I have some theories about this. So this one, I did not cut back too vigorously because I wanted to see if it would survive. Um, this is, it was its second year and it's dead. I'm almost positive when you do that, there's no green. Um, I'm not seeing any green growth. So we'll see what happens. But yet over here, sheltered by my low stone wall, I have this lavender that I trimmed back into just like a lovely little pom-pom shape. And um, it survived. I mean, it has some dead, some dead leaves in there. But I think that a lot of that has to do with the wind. Um, and just having this low block here made all the different for this one particular lavender. So um, I'm going to see if I can propagate it this fall to get some more lavender off of it. Um, I did not have luck propagating this past fall, but um, I'm gonna see if I can give it another turn. Over here on this side of the herb garden, this gets a little tricky because this is the really shady area. It's shaded by our house. Um, but we have the first shoots of sorrel. Um, I love sorrel. I think it's absolutely lovely and I plan to plant a lot more of it. I find I often get two crops out of it. So it comes out in the spring, really first thing, and then it uh, bolts and then it reseeds itself and I often get a second crop in the fall. Uh, like late in the fall. So this is a really great perennial plant to plant even here in zone 5b. Over here I have planted out some lovely spring things. We have um, some peas. I think these are a snow pea um, and I've been harvesting shoots off the top so they're a little bit smaller. Yep these are our Origo Oregon Giant going this way. And then these are um, some sugar snap peas. Now in between, I had some leftover seeds from last year and I've just planted out some Swiss chard and beets in the middle. Honestly, all of my tags blew over the other day and I don't know what is what. So we're just gonna have to see, see what happens here. Um, and then in this front row, these are just spring lettuces. So we have some arugula. I did plant some wild arugula um, and it dried out and I'm not, I don't think it's going to come back, but that's okay. I'm going to, I'll have another turn at it in the fall. Um, and then further on there, we have some uh, spinaches. So I can um, tent this if it's going to get too cold, which is what my plan is for my um, cabbages and cauliflower and green onions that I've planted further on there. My hope is after watching Charles Down and talk about this, it makes perfect sense. Um, I've got them in the ground before the caterpillars 
that would normally just ravage them are even alive yet. Um, so keeping them under cover to just give them another layer of protection, um, I'm hoping we can get an early crop of cabbages and cauliflower.